Hi, my name is Dan Koshi. I'm the executive director for the Automotive Grade Linux project at Linux Foundation. And today we'll be talking about accelerating software-defined vehicles through open source software and more specifically about how Automotive Grade Linux is addressing some of the current trends uh, in the industry. So first, just a few words about myself. Um, I'm Dan Koshi. I'm a Canadian, French-Canadian, actually living in San Jose, California now for over uh, 23 years <laughs> because it's too cold in Canada. Uh, I still play hockey at my advanced age. Um, and I was the former uh, VP general manager of the automotive division at uh, Monte Vista Software where uh, we believe we were the first in the world to deliver a Linux-based <laughs> system in an actual car. Um, so, and uh, I love wine. So I'm glad to be here in Spain because some of the best wines are here. <laughs> okay, so with that out of the way, um, you know, um, I, I sometimes start my talk by saying, you know, how, how many times do we see this? Um, this is the competition for uh, software-defined uh, vehicles. It's basically our phones, right? Because so not only do we see one phone with a sticky cup, we see two phones. Sometimes I've seen three phones, you know, Lyft, Uber, <laughs> all these things going on. And uh, it's sad. <laughs> and the reason it's sad is because this battery is a lot smaller than my car battery, and this screen is a lot smaller than my car screen. Um, but yet we still do that. And so you have to think to yourself, what, what, you, this is a, the car has a better screen, the car has a better battery, it, it should be better. And the reason it isn't is because the software sucks. That's, let's admit it, right? The software just plain sucks. And well, it, why does it suck? And how did we get here? And the, the, the reason it sucks is because um, there's too much fragmentation in the automotive industry. Now, some of this is getting fixed, finally. Some of this is getting fixed. But the history is that a car manufacturer would request, from a tier one, would request a box with a plug in the back, one for power, one for conductivity. And what was in the box, the manufacturer didn't really care. As long as they met the spec, meet, you know, it needs to have this button, it needs to have radio, it needs to have this. And so a couple of years go by, they're shipping this box in the car, and then the manufacturer asks for a new box with new specs, and the new box has completely different software because either it's from a different vendor or it's from the same vendor, but they've moved on from Microsoft to, you know, some proprietary thing. Who knows? So we've ended up with, even in the same car manufacturer, uh, different operating systems. Some car manufacturers still have to support, you know, four or five different operating systems from the past through their, you know, tier one relationships. But the bottom line is this is why we ended up in this situation. There's been no standard platform. And this is why automotive grade Linux was created. Now, we're not the only ones. There, of course, there's Android out there, and I'm going to talk about that, where we fit in terms of Android. But just at a high level, what is Automotive Grid Linux, or AGL for short? Um, you guys are all Linux Foundation attendees. You probably know all of this, but we're a nonprofit organization, open source, Linux-based collab project, hosted at Linux Foundation, and 100% focused on vehicle software. And I'm going to talk about all the areas that we address. <clears throat> um, the goal of AGL has always been to build, like I said, a single software platform that everyone can use to eliminate or, you know, at least uh, alleviate this fragmentation problem. And so we're not in the business of building a platform that you can download straight to the vehicle. What we're building is a platform that allows OEMs and their tier one partners and their tier two partners and all these companies a single platform that they can use as the starting point and then customize it. So we've always said we want to be like 70 to 80 percent of the starting point of a production project. But then the manufacturer with their partners, they select their favorite navigation provider, their favorite, um, you know, uh, uh, Bluetooth connectivity provider that is certified to connect with iPhone and Android phones. You know, they select their favorite providers, they add this to the AGL system and then they complete the system for a given piece of hardware. So we never intend at AGL to be downloadable straight to the car, because sometimes people think that. <laughs> um, and then with this, what we're hoping is that we have, uh, you know, standard kernels for a given piece of hardware, uh, standard services layers for things like Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, uh, LTE stacks, um, things like that, and then a standard application API for things like uh, navigation, which we have, voice recognition, which we have, 
um, radio, telephony, all these APIs are standard. And so then the manufacturer can really pick and choose their favorite app provider and just integrate with AGL. And the good news is because we have such a large presence now in the industry, a lot of these apps have already been ported to AGL. So it alleviates a lot of the work. So if you want to uh, Spotify in your vehicle, well, Spotify has already been ported to AGL. So chances are it's quite easy to do because it's, it's probably a one or two weeks work, to be honest. <clears throat> At AGL, we're strongly a code first organization. And the reason I mention this is because a lot of other organizations in the automotive industry are spec first, specification driven. And often uh, is the case they don't have any code at all. They just have specs. And then what happens is vendors write code and become compliant to the spec. So they end up having, uh, you know, vendor A, vendor B, vendor C, all having compliance. But if you look at the code, they're all different. So now we're back to step one. Different code, different code bases, different kernels, more fragmentation. So at AGL, we said, we're not going to do that. We're not going to have a spec, and we're not going to have a compliance program, despite a lot of pressure from big tier one companies to do this, because they want to build their own platform and be compliant to AGL. And we said, no, nope, we're not doing that. If you want to be AGL, you've got to download AGL from our website. That's the starting point. That ensures that everyone's using the same code. And we still have that strong motto to this day. Um, AGL, we started at first by uh, supporting infotainment, or IVI, in-vehicle infotainment, and that's because this was uh, the biggest pain point for the automotive manufacturers, you know, trying to be, you know, uh, competitive with the smartphone. Uh, infotainment is the first thing we worked on. Uh, but since then, and many years now, we've uh, added instrument cluster, heads-up display, telematics, and we're also working on functional safety and ADAS, which I'll talk about in some future slides here. Um, but we're already addressing all of the first four functions, and we have been for, wow, probably seven years now, eight years um, was our first release. We have 10 manufacturers supporting the project. Um, you can see here we have very strong support uh, in Japan. We have uh, Honda, Mazda, Mitsubishi Motors, Nissan, Suzuki, Toyota uh, in Japan. We have uh, Hyundai in South Korea, SAIC in China, and Mercedes and Volkswagen in Germany. So we have a pretty good uh, uh, distribution uh, ge geographically. Uh, notably missing is USA. Uh, we did have Ford for a while, uh, but unfortunately they dropped out of AGL because they've, they're, I think, uh, adopting an ad Android strategy. Uh, but nonetheless, we have you know, quite, quite good support. And when we say Volkswagen Group, we want to mention that it includes all the Volkswagen logos including, uh, you know, the, the, the very expensive cars. And uh, I know Bugatti has been working with AGL because I met them at Consumer Electronics Show and I asked if I could uh, have a loaner car from them so that I could, uh, <laughs> so, so I could demonstrate AGL and make sure AGL is fully supported on the Bugatti. And they said, Dan, we only sell 43 cars a year in America and you're not getting one. <laughs> so I didn't get one, unfortunately. <clears throat> Uh, we have over 150 members at AGL. Uh, I believe we're about the third or fourth largest uh, project at Linux Foundation, uh, both in terms of membership and, and, uh, and uh, membership dues and things like that. Um, we have a, quite a nice uh, uh, diversity of companies. We have, of course, the automotive companies, the OEMs, the tier ones such as Denso, Panasonic, Aishin, uh, 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 Harman, uh, Continental, Bosch, <laughs> pretty much all of the big ones. And then we have most of the semiconductor providers, such as Renesas, Intel, Qualcomm, NXP, TI, NVIDIA. Um, so pretty good, uh, you know, automotive uh, membership. But lately, we've been attracting a lot of small companies, companies with 50 people, 100 people, doing very specific things like security. We have companies from Israel doing security work for automotive. We have, you know, and they're not traditional automotive companies, but they're like involved in the ecosystem. And that's what we wanted to do from the very beginning at AGL is include all these smaller companies that want to be part of this new connected car ecosystem. And I think we're succeeding at that quite nicely. And then I have one more slide marketing wise, and then I'll get on to the software. <laughs> um, two more slides, actually. Um, we uh, first ship AGL in a 2018 Toyota Camry. Um, and since then, 
virtually all Toyotas and Lexus run uh, AGL. We also have uh, most of the Subaru uh, Legacy and Outback run AGL, uh, some Mer Mercedes-Benz vans, and we're expecting several uh, Japanese makers uh, in the coming few years, if not sooner, uh, and also uh, some big logos that I showed before from Germany uh, expecting to come out with AGL-based uh, cars. Um, where we stand in the market, um, we're actually leading Android, which is nice. Uh, this is not a chart I produced. This is a chart that came from IHS Market, a big uh, analyst firm. And you can see orange is, the, uh, is AGL, and then the light green is Android Automotive. And as of 2023, we're roughly, uh, AGL is roughly at like 18, 19%, and uh, Android is at, I don't know, four or five. Um, so not too bad. And the reason Linux is down, that's what they're calling generic Linux. Uh, it's because it's being replaced with AGL over time. Um, and then the one at top, which is the gray, is actually what I call the Android fork that is mostly used in, in China, uh, where you don't get any Google support, you don't get any Google apps, you don't get Google updates, you, you, you get none of that. It's basically you take Android, you fork it, and you go off with your open source code and, and build your own. Okay, let's talk about software now. So AGL uh, UCB, um, we named it UCB, it stands for Unified Code Base. And the reason we named it UCB was very deliberate, is to kind of emphasize that we're trying to alleviate the problem of fragmentation. So it's very marketing uh, related. Um, <clears throat> we name our releases after Fish, in case you didn't know. Uh, this is a fun thing we do. Uh, uh, Google named uh, their releases after desserts, and we said, we got to find something cool. And uh, Walt Miner, my colleague, he said, let's do fish. And I'm like, fish? Okay. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if it, because we have so many Japanese members, he was thinking sushi, but um, anyways, so Agile Albacore was the very first release in 2016, all the way down to Magic Marlin, and then I'll show you the latest releases in a minute. The point of this chart is not to show you a bunch of fish, it's to show you that we have uh, kind of a, we have, first of all, we're doing two releases a year every year since 2016. And we have kind of a TikTok model where um, the release that comes uh, earlier in the year, meaning Q1, tends to be uh, feature rich, where we have new features that we demonstrate at Consumer Electronics Show. And then the release mid year tends to be less feature rich and more focused on bug fixing and hardening and long term support. And so what we recommend to uh, companies that start projects is you should take the summer release, or your summer, fall, you know, it's always around August, September-ish time frame. Uh, Nifty Needlefish was released uh, August last year. And uh, one of the most important things there is that we, well, a few of the important things is that we uh, switch to Yocto long-term support release 4.0, Kirkstone is the name. So we try to align with Yocto uh, long-term support releases so that we get the LTS support from Yocto and then we pass that on uh, to our BSPs and the rest of our software to uh, uh, the AGL stack basically. Um, this was the release where we started really moving to Flutter. So we're moving away from uh, QT in terms of app framework and moving to Flutter and I'll talk about Flutter specifically in a few slides. And this is also the release where we started supporting WebOS um, uh, for uh, OSC and Chromium. Uh, we've been supporting Vert.io for several years. Uh, in fact, the people doing the Vert.io work, if you're familiar with Vert.io virtualization, um, uh, Vert.io is also what Android supports. We, su we, you know, we support the exact same Vert.io. And the cool part is the people doing this work are from Panasonic. They're leading this effort, and they, have, they are, are actually the one that have written the code for AGL as well. So now we have the exact same code for Android and AGL. And why is that important? Well, at AGL, we support more than just infotainment. We support instrument cluster. And so if you have a Vert IO environment and a single processor, you can run AGL instrument cluster side by side with Android. And that's very attractive for several automotive companies because many of them have chosen Android. Um, for whatever reason. And um, 
in those cases, you can still use AGL for instrument cluster because you know Google doesn't support that. And so that's quite attractive for us because then we get to participate in those vehicles and it's attractive for the automotive manufacturer. Optimistic Octopus, which is difficult to pronounce, <laughs> it was released in February of this year. Um, this release, uh, we uh, uh, updated to the latest version of Kirkstone, but also we uh, added um, uh, Flutter Auto Embedder and uh, a new home screen, dashboard, new HVAC apps, uh, et cetera. So a lot of updates based on, on again, uh, us adopting Flutter. Um, and uh, we also did a, <clears throat> an IVI and uh, instrument cluster uh, demo using containers. So we were able to, you can run it in a virtualized environment with uh, hypervisors, either commercial hypervisors or open source hypervisors like KVM, or you can run it straight with containers. So really all the deployment options are there and, and it's up to the manufacturer and, and their partners to decide um, what to do. We also added VertIO loopback support um, and uh, a little while back, we used to support um, Smack for uh, security, and we moved to SE Linux, and we enable SE Linux in the image, but in permissive mode, and then it is up to the manufacturer and, and their partners to decide, you know, the, what policy they want to apply. But SE Linux is fully supported in AGL now. The latest release is Prickly Pike, was released uh, very recently in August, uh, August 10th actually. This is our 16th release. Um, some of the interesting work here is that we've added actually, um, or updated, uh, significantly updated support for KUXA. Now KUXA is a um, vehicle signaling standard, was developed by uh, Covesa and W3C, I believe, uh, jointly, and we we're not sure, but we believe we're one of the only hosts of actual code for KUXA in the world, so that's pretty cool. Um, so we have full support for that. We also added, um, uh, uh, the, we actually updated uh, the container demo that I mentioned before for instrument cluster and IVI, uh, and we added DRM uh, lease manager for uh, the instrument cluster as well. <clears throat> uh, you can find a lot more detail on the release notes on our website here. So AGL, we've never stood still. Um, when we started the project, and our first release was 2016, as I showed you, there was a lot of things missing in the industry. For example, we had to write our own audio manager from scratch, because in a car, it's not like another device, because if, if you have a phone call coming in and the navigation's trying to talk to you, and there's an emergency situation with ADAS, you know, the audio has to be layered properly with proper priorities. And believe it or not, it sounds simple to implement, but it's not. It's actually quite difficult because every car has their own requirements. And so we had to write our own audio manager and we've dumped it now because now we use Pipewire and we have the ability to do that. So that's just one great example. Yeah, <laughs> that's just one great example where we've never stood still and we don't, we don't mind throwing stuff away that we've written if there's something better that comes along. And th this chart actually shows several examples, right? We started with uh, App Toolkit, QT, and now we're moving to Flutter and uh, Web App Manager, you know? Um, we wrote our own audio manager, now we use Pipewire. We were using Smack, we realized Smack is kind of dying, let's move to SE Linux, it has better support. Um, we started with a uh, IVI shell and now we have an AGL compositor, you know. These are just examples that we're not standing still and we're always willing and open to adopt new things. So if there's something in your community or your project that you want us to adopt, we're super open to it. Just come, propose it, uh, you know, the, we have a, a system architecture team that will look at it and then the steering committee will make a decision and decide whether we should adopt it or not. But we're very open to those kinds of things. <clears throat> In terms of expert groups, these are the experts group we have today. Um, in other uh, communities, they're called work groups. We, we call them expert groups, but we don't want to scare people away. You don't have to be an expert to be, my, my colleague always says this, you don't have to be an expert to participate in an expert group. Um, we want everyone to participate and it's open to anyone. Um, some of the ones that have been the most active uh, in the past, application framework and security, connectivity, 
continuous integration and testing, these are all still uh, active. Speech recognition is kind of died down now because we, we've completed. Uh, actually, uh, Nuance and the Amazon Alexa team are the two companies that wrote the speech rec APIs for us. So two of the biggest leaders in, in the industry wrote those, and, and those are kind of finished. Virtualization is super active, and vehicle to cloud is super active, and container and service mesh is super active, to the point where these two were working on very similar things, so we decided to merge them and re redefine the name to uh, software-defined vehicles. And uh, basically, we've been announcing this for the past few weeks now. Uh, this is a new uh, expert group led by Panasonic. Jerry Tsao of Panasonic is leading this effort. And in our very first meeting, we already had some really big companies participating, such as Amazon, AWS, Volkswagen, Arm, Virtual Open System, et cetera, Harman, uh, as you can see. And this is a call for people in the community to participate. If you're interested in this, I think this is probably, without exaggerating, probably the hottest expert group in terms of uh, expectations and uh, participation that we've had at AGL since our inception. Um, a lot of companies are looking at the future of software for cars, and they're saying things have to change. We have to change the way we deploy things in vehicles. We have to use containers. We have to be able to push updates not that you know are not entire images. <laughs> we can push you know uh, uh, car, you know containerized updates. These kinds of things are the things that this group will be working on. That combined with virtualization. And I think this is the future of automotive. These kinds of things will probably not be deployed in cars in the next year or two, but we're talking five years out. You know, this is the kind of thing that, that the industry needs in order to get out of this you know, constant difficulty of deploying software for vehicles. And so we expect big things from this group, and we hope to see a lot of participation from the community. I'm going to talk about a few more uh, key AGL developments. Um, we build our own hardware <laughs> at AGL. This is not well known. Um, we don't do this to make money. Actually, we, we sell it at, at zero profit uh, because we're a nonprofit. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but we build our own hardware because it's very difficult to find uh, reference hardware in the industry. Um, you sometimes, most of the time, have to sign NDAs. You have to get your legal department to look at it. You have to. Uh, uh, then spend, you know, potentially several thousand dollars per board. So we decided to provide the community with the hardware, and so we already have uh, these boards that we sell uh, from with a Renaissance SOC. It's the Renaissance R car, and we have this sandwich architecture where um, the bottom board is the vehicle board. So you have all of the, you know, signaling, CAN bus, things like that. Uh, the middle board is the peripherals, like audio and camera and, and visual. And then the top board is the SOC, the SOC, the uh, uh, processor. And the idea is that you can swap out the, the processor with a new uh, processor board anytime, and the software will be virtually unaffected. Um, of course, you need different software image to be downloaded, but, but the overall APIs, everything, nothing changes. And so this is available for purchase here. We're uh, planning to add uh, Qualcomm SOC. That work is ongoing now. Um, in the near future, we hope to have that as well. Oh, I just want to add one more thing. So there's actually one car company that I know of looking at this concept for actual deployment, where if they have a problem with uh, supplying, uh, like a supplier supplying a specific processor, they can quickly switch manufacturing by changing the sandwich to a new SOC and have almost little, very little effect on the actual software. And so there's a, uh, I can't say who, but there's a company looking at this for actual building cars and deployments, which I thought was quite, quite interesting. Uh, another key development is uh, AWS is uh, helping us put AGL on the AWS Graviton, which is a cloud-based ARM64 processor. Uh, this is great for developers to be able to develop and test from anywhere in the world, from home or from sitting right in this room. Um, so this is yet another great option, and we're really happy that AWS is helping us with that. Uh, this should be available very shortly. I don't know the latest status, but I thought it was going to be released this month, so hopefully we, we get that done. <clears throat> I mentioned Flutter several times in this uh, discussion. Um, 
If you're not familiar with Flutter, it's an app and UI development toolkit. It's a, an alternative to Qt, if you will, because Qt is quite well known. Um, it was originally developed by Google as an open source project, and, but it wasn't automotive specific. And what Toyota did is, is they, uh, they took that and applied several automotive specific features to it, including different uh, screen um, aspect ratios and things like that. And they contributed all that code back to AGL. And so we are the home of automotive flutter, if you will. And uh, we believe that this will become the de facto standard. We already know of one other big German car company that is looking at standardizing on Flutter. Uh, if that happens and Toyota is already standardizing on it, it will become the de facto standard, I believe. So it's not up to me and it's not up to us, but we're supporting it. We're part of this effort and, <laughs> and uh, we, we hope this happens. Uh, we think it's the future. And so we're right in the middle of it. <clears throat> Uh, Vert.io is also the future. Uh, this is pretty, pretty clear because we support it, Android supports it. There's really, at this point, no other game in town for uh, virtualization of, of I.O. And what's great about this is it allows um, um, AGL to run anywhere, uh, natively or on a you know, specific SOC or even on a, in a cloud environment with no change. And this is already being demonstrated, this already works. It's not pie in the sky stuff, and we hope that eventually uh, car manufacturers will actually start using this in their deployments. Uh, I mentioned earlier functional safety. So we're also working with another Linux Foundation project called ELISA. Um, ELISA is uh, working on enabling Linux in safety application. That's what it stands for. Uh, things like nuclear power plants, aviation, train control systems, things that require serious functional safety. Uh, Elisa is working on those things. We're uh, leading the automotive work group within Elisa. Um, and so our hope is to bring our, in, our, our first attempt will be to bring our instrument cluster software release to functional safety ready uh, uh, status. And by ready, what I mean is you can't get real functional safety certification uh, on reference hardware. You need the final hardware, which is only available to the car manufacturer. We never see final hardware. And so, but we will do everything necessary such as the testing, the artifacts, the, the, the documentation needed, needed, all these things, with the goal that the manufacturer can take all that and that's hopefully like 70, 80 percent of what they need and then go get certified on the final hardware. And we have one leading OEM that is planning to do this for our instrument cluster uh, project. I want to quickly just mention AGL events because this is a cool part of what we do at AGL. Uh, it's a great uh, uh, part of participating in our community. We had an uh, all-member meeting in Berlin recently. <laughs> this is pretty funny because you may have seen in the news the uh, Radisson Hotel in Berlin had a giant aquarium that blew up. You saw, yeah, we, we were supposed to have our all-member meeting two weeks just before that happened. <laughs> like, uh, sorry, two weeks, uh, you know, our date was two weeks from that explosion. And uh, uh, so, so we had two weeks to find a new hotel. And it's not easy, by the way. <laughs> and uh, so that was pretty funny that our AMM was, was almost canceled because of an exploding aquarium. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's the fish. It's the fish. Revenge of the fish. That's a good one. I didn't think about that. Um, anyway, so, so uh, this was a very successful event, and I'm, I'm glad we, uh, we were able to pull it off. Every year we participate also in Embedded World, and this is a great uh, uh, opportunity for our members to participate for free. They can participate in our booth, show a demo of their stuff running with AGL. Um, so if your company is a member and you'd like to participate, you can contact me anytime. We're going to be there next year again. This is a fantastic event for automotive, in my, in my opinion. Um, we also had the very first uh, ALS Europe this year. Uh, ALS, Auto, which is, stands for Automotive Linux Summit, normally is always in Japan. Well, now we have two. So we have one in Japan and one in Europe. And so we had the very first one in Prague in June, and that was really well attended. And it was part of what Linux Foundation calls Embedded uh, Open Source Summit, which replaces the old Embedded Linux Conference. So Embedded Linux Conference no longer exists. It's been replaced with EOSS, and we're planning to have another one next year, and uh, AGL will participate. We also recently had our all-member meeting in Japan, which was in July. That was super successful. 
And uh, coming up uh, next month, we're going to participate in the Automotive Software Expo uh, in Yokohama. And again, our members can participate in our booth and show a demo of their stuff. Uh, so if you're interested in participating, you can contact me. Uh, and then our biggest event of the year is Automotive Linux Summit uh, Japan. This will be at the Adiake Convention Center uh, December 5 and 6. Just to give you an idea, um, this event pre-COVID was attended by about 2,000 people. So very, very well attended event for, uh, for automotive. And finally, we're going to participate in Consumer Electronics Show. AGL will have a quite large booth here next to Mercedes, next to uh, Carryad, Hyundai, Hyundai Motors, Qualcomm, you know, right in the middle of the automotive stuff at CES. And again, our members can participate in the booth. This is what it looked like one year where we had two vehicles uh, showing AGL demos, and then big companies like NTT Data, LG, Panasonic, et cetera, showing demos of their stuff running uh, AGL. And this is the front. And you can take a photo of this if you wish, but these are also the upcoming events. And we've already decided we're going to have our uh, AGL next all-member meeting uh, in end of February, which will be in Tokyo, uh, probably the week of Feb 26. We're finalizing a hotel now. And then we'll do the AMM in uh, summer in July, and that'll be in Berlin again because we're getting really good attendance in Berlin. Uh, it's convenient for a lot of people. And so that's also going to be uh, in, uh, in uh, contract phase uh, for July. And that's all I have for uh, slides, and I have time for questions. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we've had that. So the question was, you know, does AGL support long-term support LTS, and what's your strategy? So we've had that discussion many times inside AGL, and um, there's always been a debate. So some big companies um, want us to do long-term support, right? They want us to work, you know, support something for 10 years. Other companies say, no, 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 we want AGL to be an incubator of technology. We want you to focus on, you know, new stuff, incubating things, cutting edge. We'll worry about the long-term support. And, and you can see why, because some of the tier ones make their money on the long-term support, right? Let's face it, it's, it's a business. And so they don't want AGL to be that. They want AGL to be just incubating things that they can use. And so... Honestly, at AGL, our long-term support right now is that we support the uh, Yocto long-term support, but then that's where it stops. We, we support uh, our releases for up to uh, a year and a half to two years. We do dot releases, things like that, but we don't do a 10-year release, not yet. But having said that, there's pressure to do it, and we may do it, and it depends on the steering committee. Yes. Sure. Yeah, that's absolutely true. That's a challenge for any yeah, long-term support. Yeah. Yeah. So, so today, it's mostly the large SOCs, very powerful multi-core processors. Um, uh, ARM, they're all ARM-based, pretty much. Uh, we do support an Intel board uh, for reference, but I don't believe anyone's using that for production. Um, so uh, we don't support any kind of, I don't know, I would say small ECUs <laughs> today, uh, but it's certainly not out of the realm of possibility. But today, we support, you know, um, uh, uh, Renesas, Qualcomm, uh, NXP, uh, TI, those, those SOCs. Yeah. Uh, if someone wants us to support it, they should 
join AGL and tell us what you want. <laughs> no, really, we're, we're that open, right? If someone needs support, we, we will support any hardware. Uh, the only requirement is that it has to have a Yocto base, BSP, because that's what we pull from. And the other one is it has to be supported. So if it doesn't build and something breaks, whoever manufactures that chip needs to help us. They need to, they need to fix it within a day or two or, or else it won't build. You know? We don't have the manpower to go you know, fixing a million bugs in BSPs. We just don't. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's uh, partly with, uh, I mean, um, I, I think a big part of it is, is the car companies wanting something new and something more cutting edge. And the thought was that Flutter, because Toyota is having great momentum, like you said, with it. And now we know of at least one large German company, maybe two, <laughs> um, that might adopt it. There's just a lot of momentum behind it. Um, that's the primary reason. Yeah, and, and the tier ones too, by the way, not just the OEMs. Uh, several tier ones want us to use Flutter, so that's yeah, that's why it happened. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, we don't get involved in that as an open source project, <laughs> so I don't want to comment on that, but I'm, I'm sure there's some car companies may have had licensing issues, yeah. <laughs> Any other question? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, actually, yes. Um, I met with uh, John Deere. And they said they were using AGL for all sorts of things, uh, the big combines to, you know, track tracking and things like that. And uh, yeah, <laughs> comment? Yeah. Hmm. That. Yeah, that's what I've been. That's what I was told when I met with them. Yeah, not under NDA. So, <laughs> any other? You had another question? Yeah. 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 Well, I I think it's all let's face it, it's all commercially driven, right? So if, if Toyota, which we know uses AGL, wants Spotify, they tell Spotify, we want you to port it, and then they have to, right? So that tends to be the, the, first, the first port tends to be a commercial reason behind it. But then once it's ported, I feel, this is what I've seen, those companies tend to maintain it because they have to maintain that one customer anyway. So then it's easy for others to adopt because they've already ported it, they already have it, and they maintain it for different well, that's what I've seen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Oh, wow. Okay. I'd love to talk to you after and find out what companies. <laughs> okay. Yes. So, uh, of course, the code base is over 100 million lines of code. So we have a ton of licenses, right? Uh, <laughs> there's not one license. But our incoming license, if you want to contribute new code, is Apache V2 for new code. Yeah. So uh, TPLDC is getting very hard to deal with over there? Yep. So no, we don't, we don't do anything special for GPLV3. We don't try to avoid it. We don't. We treat it like anything else. If it's a package we need, we use it. <clears throat> and if the manufacturer or whatever has an issue with that, that's, that's their problem. It's up to them to find an alternative or work with their vendor to replace it. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yes. Yeah, that's the plan. Yeah. I can't, I can't say who, <laughs> but I can say it's a big OEM, and uh, they've been working on it for, wow, I want to say four years, uh, and uh, th they have the funding to bring it to fruition. So it's not just a pie-in-the-sky R&D project. They actually want to bring it to real production. Yeah. Yeah, and that's uh, AGL running natively without a hypervisor. Um, so that means full functional safety. Because, what, because today, the way to get around functional safety, I know because I, I was the, like I said, the VPGM of um, automotive division at Monte Vista, and we, we did the Chevy Volt instrument cluster. And the, the way we did that is that we did an overlay with uh, uh, an RTOS underneath that was certified that does the overlay of the critical functions, and then Linux is used for the, all the fancy graphics and everything around it. And this overlay thing is how a lot of companies have used Linux in instrument cluster. But to use Linux natively without a hypervisor, without an RTOS, that's the goal of, of this instrument cluster expert group. Correct. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Okay, well, sorry folks, we're out of time, but thank you very much for joining. Thanks. <laughs>